This Week in Startups is brought to you by Masterworks, the first company allowing investors exposure into the blue chip artwork asset class. This Week in Startups listeners can skip the 5,000 person wait list by going to i.masterworks.io slash twist. LinkedIn, a business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And Captera, the leading free online resource to find the best software solutions. Visit captera.com slash twist for free today to find the right tools to make 2020 the year for your business. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. Healthcare is the most brutal space to start a startup in right along with education and construction. If you're an entrepreneur and you decide you want to build houses or apartments, or you decide you want to try to teach people something over the internet or with technology, or God forbid, you jump into the healthcare space, you are in for a world of pain. Almost all the investments I make in the healthcare space, let alone music or construction or education, they go to zero. But we're starting to see some founders, the dogged ones, the self-possessed ones who will not give up breakthrough. And when they do breakthrough, there is a huge prize because there are huge problems to be solved in the world, in housing, in education, and in healthcare. Music, actually, Spotify figured it out. Before that, everybody went out of business. And this is why I encourage founders to find those hard, hard categories and to do the work. Today on the program, Jeff jo- Today on the program, Jeff Dotches is with us. He is the CEO and founder of one drop and one of my oldest friends in the industry we met back in 94 and 95 good to see you my friend you too man thanks for having me on well you heard my preamble (laughs) you masochistic insane person five or six years ago you came to me and said i have diabetes i collapsed in an elevator and you were on episode 547 back in June of 2015. And mm-hmm. we talked about your vision for OneDrop, which everybody can go visit right now at OneDrop.today. And I believe in the Apple Store. Yep. Uh, so you can go visit in two places, online and off. And you had a vision for solving uh, diabetes and helping people manage it. What was the original vision and how has it turned out since? It's a great question, and as uh, as you know, you know I, I was diagnosed in 2013 with type one diabetes, which is really strange for somebody my age, and I got about six minutes with a nurse practitioner and an insulin pen and a prescription and a pat on the back, and I was out the door with this diagnosis, and I and I freaked out, you know, I went home and I cried and I uh, threw a pity party for a couple of days, and and then I kind of pulled myself up by the bootstraps and thought. You know, I wonder if there's a way to bring together all the pieces of information that I need to make better choices um, and have all that in one place, um, bring together a a professional coach uh, and and do so in a way that is um, really user friendly and, 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 and can provide, you know, accessibility to people. And so... Uh, we started out, you know, with this idea that if we started collecting all this data, that the data could provide insights to people. Um, but we first had to f- solve the problem of of getting the data, mm. right? So there's all and the data know, in diabetes specifically yeah. is doing a blood test. It's glucose information. Right. It's food. It's medication. It's ah. physical activity. It's sleep. Stress. Oh, heart, right. All of those all things those play things, a part. Yeah, a huge part. Yeah. And and yet in the diabetes industry, there's nobody. That's bringing all those things together to They're look all at them in one disparate, way. Uh, silos parts of data. Of, yeah, silos that's right. of data. That's right. Your Fitbit or your watch that's tells right. you how many steps you did, maybe how many calories you burned. You have a what do they call it? A, a glucose meter. Glucose meter that has one set of data. That's right. Your diet you have to self-report. That's right. Um, and medication, I guess, you have to self-report as you well. Do. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. so once you have bits and pieces of those information, which we, which we didn't, this was a hypothesis, you know, if I had all that information, could I make it useful to people in a right. way that could become preventative? Like, adva- like Elon Musk, right? Advanced yeah. collision avoidance systems on these cars, right? Right. Can we provide advanced collision avoidance systems for people with health mm. problems? You know, where I'm telling you what's going to happen to you in advance of it happening so you can avoid the collision. Wow. And that was the hypothesis in 2015, but we had a lot of steps to go through to get to a place where we had, you know, the right amount of information where we could start to, to do those kinds of 
of predictions. And now we do. And that first uh, step was making an app where people, a beautiful, stunning, gorgeous app that motivated people, the design was so beautiful, I remember, that motivated people to log data. Correct. And at what point did the logging of data lead to enough data for you to start making inferences and give advice? And, and then what did you have to do in order to to sort of get there? Because a lot of people, when they pitch me on an investment, say, oh, we're going to have the data, we're going to give advice. Oh, we're going we're gonna to get all this data, we're going to tell people what to do. And then they never get the data or they get the data and they're never able to make it actionable. H- how do you go from collecting data to then making data actionable? The collecting data, I think, was the hard part, right? We we had we way underestimated how hard it would be to get um, different players in the industry to allow us to partner with them to get the data, uh, um, or to get people to to log stuff, right, mm-hmm. or to to enter the data. So we started looking for ways to make it simple, like Siri or Alexa commands, or um, integration through HealthKit through thousands of other apps and devices that are out there. Or um, by, in the end, you know, manufacturing our own glucose meter ah. um, because we didn't want to get locked out of glucose information that, or, or be beholden to the healthcare industry's slow bureaucratic bullshit pace. Yeah. Um, and those uh, glucose meters were expensive and dumb when you got into the industry or were they getting smarter? Were they connected devices at all they back were, in 2015? They were expensive and dumb and not connected. So there was, I think, not even one connected glucose meter at that time. And when you decide to build a company and you start with software and then you've got to go into hardware and you're in healthcare, you now have increased the degree of difficulty to a level that is just seemingly insurmountable. Hardware is super hard. How long? The app you got done in in six months, a year, something like that, I remember. And, and it got cranking, mm-hmm. but the hardware, that took a couple of years, didn't it? It took two years. We were designing the hardware at the same time we were building the app. Yeah. Um, and then you have to start to sort of imagine what um, FDA process would be like, what manufacturing, uh, you know, prototyping, getting machines tooled, um, all that stuff. And so fortunately, I mean, I got to knock on wood, we, we found a, a manufacturing partner to work with um, that was really great. Um, here in the United States or China, Here Taiwan? Here in the United States, Got yes, it. with Chinese factories. Got it. And we um, worked out, that, you know, no one would talk to us originally. So I went to all the big, you know, glucose meter manufacturers and no one would even have a conversation with us. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even take the phone call. Really? Um, and then, you know, we found um, a high quality, super accurate um, glucose meter manufacturer that would work with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been a great partner since then. And then people started subscribing to it. And then eventually you got it in the app store, the Apple store, not the app store, but the Mm -hmm. actual physical Apple store. Was that a big unlock or was it a victory for, you know, just PR? Um, People are always curious about that. Yeah. I I think our hardware product sold through retail. And so we're in um, Apple stores nationwide in the U.S. and then um, now in Walmart stores nationwide in the mm-hmm. U.S. Um, and you'll see us in, in a whole bunch of other retail stores. But but getting into the Apple store w- was um, in a way like a a vote of confidence for the consumerization of healthcare. Mm. As you started to see Apple bring health to the phone and health to the watch, right? And who knows what's going to happen with AirPods or some of the other yeah. Apple health efforts. Um, their commitment to these consumer-friendly, you know, health products um, by putting us into the store, you know, we're in, in physical retail stores where there's very limited shelf space and right. there's very few products at the Apple store. That vote of confidence for us felt yeah. so validating in so many ways. You know, we're struggling all this time and and trying to grind it out and finally get FDA approval and then finally start selling subscriptions and and then – and then Apple, um, you know, selects us to be in the store, and, and that was really a, 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 a confidence-building, validating moment. I'm, I'm sure investors. We were early investors. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Yep. Full disclosure. Um, and, thank you. Oh, thank you for having us come along for the ride. It's worked out pretty good so far. Um, you, when you uh, have to raise money, and you go to investors and say it's healthcare, and it's hardware. <laughs> It's regulated. How many investors are just like, you know what? 
and it's just too hard. I, I'm not down. <laughs> a lot. I yeah. mean, you know, uh, you know, there's a certain type of investor that's willing to go on the ride with you. Yeah. Um, and we're very fortunate to have some great investors, you know, on board. Um, RRE, you know, in New York um, has been amazing. Uh, Stu Elman, shout out to you, Stu. Uh, he's 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 been fantastic. Yeah, um, and, and the whole an RRE crew. since the nineties. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. outstanding, great investor. Um, and then uh, Bayer, you know, came in on the on the Series B recently, you know, with a huge vote of confidence for us. So that was that yeah. was a, a um, so so having investors that that are willing to either ride along with the journey. You know, um, you've been fabulous. Uh, oh, you know, well, you know some of the other, <laughs> some of the other folks, um, and then and then have that validated by you know one of the largest healthcare companies in the world um, has been has been humbling. All right. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know how this Bayer forty million dollars Series B, or, or they let it went down because there's a big controversy in Silicon Valley. Do you get involved with strategics? Do you not? I want to know how you came to that decision. <clears throat> how it happened, how you negotiated it, uh, and why they, they didn't choose to just buy you versus, say, investing and letting you remain an independent company when we get back on This Week in Startups. I met an amazing company. I had coffee with the founder, and I was totally inspired. It's called Masterworks. And in 2018, you know, VCs invested over $100 billion in startups. But did you know there is a $1.7 trillion, T, trillion, dollar asset class that is uncorrelated to public equities and has outperformed the S&P and has no institutional investors allocating to it. That company and that category is art. The company is masterworks.io and it's the first company to allow any type of investor, whether retail or accredited. Any of you can then go gain exposure to blue chip artwork. This year, roughly 68 billion dollars in art will trade hands between collectors uh, all around the globe. Deloitte estimates the size of the blue chip artwork asset class to be 1.7 trillion. And all of these transactions are between individuals. There is no way to invest in this asset class unless you purchase painting. And Masterworks.io is trying to change all this by being the first platform to file paintings with the SEC. In the same process that a company goes public, They'll take an artwork public and allow you to buy uh, shares in it. Today, Masterworks has over 30,000 investors signed up and using their platform. So I want you to go to I, the letter I, dot Masterworks dot I-O. I dot Masterworks dot I-O to skip the 5,000 person waiting list. They've got so many people interested in this that they created a special way for our listeners to jump the line because we don't want to wait in line. It's a brilliant idea. The founder's brilliant. I had a great uh, coffee with him when I was in New York, and I'm, I'm really intrigued by this business. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. Okay, uh, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, everybody, welcome back. Jeff Dotchis is here, one of my oldest friends, the founder of Razorfish in the 90s when I met him and was the first advertiser in my first, uh, my second magazine, Silicon Eye Reporter, Cyber Surfer was the first. Uh, thanks for doing that. <laughs> Took me a couple of decades to, to come back and pay you back and invest in your company. But uh, boy, is that one of the great joys in life is a friendship that 100%. goes on for decades. 100%. And get to support each other. And it's funny, you know, I have I have all of our old emails. Like I literally have yeah. all the emails since wow. 1994. Oh my right? Lord. And I don't have so, any. <laughs> Yeah, I'll pull up some of the That'd emails with you and me, man. <laughs> That's hysterical. Really great. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I got to see those. Um and you don't want to see him. You <laughs> don't want to see them. I'm a crazy person. You and I arguing. No, I'm a crazy person. Oh, you and I arguing over yeah, something. <laughs> something. Yes, probably because I was not only were you an advertiser, but I was covering your company. And yeah. then every, you know, obviously when you're a journalist and you cover something, you don't get everything right, or you know, the truth can be interpreted and you get something wrong, and yeah, there could be a little back and forth. And email that, was new at that time, right. so you can have a long back and forth. <laughs> um, trust me, there's a lot of those emails out yeah. there. I was a crazy person too no, back I, in my. I was totally we cool. were crazy people in our twenties yeah. and thirties, but. Boy, what a run New York was, huh? Everything. Oh God, it's, it's, New York I'm, I'm, in the 90s. I am grateful for every minute of of my career and my life so far. It's been yeah. just all a blessing. It's been such people a just don't understand how awesome that period of the nineties yeah. was. Nineties in New York when the internet hit, it was like art, culture, tech, everything, finance, business, fashion, finance, everything. Yeah, advertising, yeah. marketing, it all just came together, yeah, and absolutely. everybody felt so hopeful. It was really hopeful. It was really hopeful. It felt like, well, we can solve a lot of problems and everybody's going to win. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's it was... funny. Uh, you know, our office now today is on uh, uh, 166 Mercer Street. And yeah. it's 
um, my uh, it's a full sort of floor and on the Mercer Street side, but on the Broadway side, it looks out directly on t- into our old office, our first Razor Fish office. Was that Bond Street? Um, no, no. The first Razor Fish office was 580 Broadway. Oh, right, 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 right. And right. we I look, I look right into there, you know, and yep. so it's really, and there's a good energy, like there's a good energy in Soho. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it always, yeah. 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 It's so. amazing. So you, you, how did this bear thing go down mm-hmm. and how does one make the decision you know, to have a strategic in there. Um, and why didn't they just buy it? Because like, they have tons of money. And usually when they see something as innovative as one drop, they just decide, hey, let's just, you know, mm-hmm. let's just buy it. Was that you just didn't want to sell yet? Or um, they wanted you to be independent? How did, how did you find them? How did the decision go down? Take, me, take, take the audience through that because they're founders who can't imagine in a lot of cases how one would ever negotiate with the company as big as Bayer. So... Let's see. Um, first, there's a personal relationship. Um, the CEO of Bayer Pharmaceutical used to be the CEO of Sanofi, the French pharmaceutical company, di- oh, wow. Diabetes, uh, Sanofi Diabetes Unit. And so um, I'd been doing work with Sanofi for uh. ma- for several years now um, and their teams and everything. And so um, that CEO and I developed a personal relationship. Um, That's simple. Um, and so he ended up he was at Bayer, he went to Santa Fe, and then he went back to Bayer as the CEO of Bayer Pharmaceutical. Huh. And so when he shifted roles, um, I started talking to him about what we could do together. And he, you know, to me, and we kept our kind of energy and our rapport going. And um, that's really was, was the sort of the seed and the germination of how we started to, you know, get there with the Series B. And then um, as... They were working through their strategy about what do we want to do in digital? Do we want to be doing digital therapeutics as point solutions inside each, as a companion to every drug that we have? Or do we want to have a broader digital platform that um, that can focus on health and wellness, you know, for people or what? what they're working through their strategy. And then I, I just said, hey, you know, um, I think we can fill a very big chunk of your strategic hole hmm. if um, if – if we can work together. And so that's really was was how the deal sort of germinated. It was a Series B investment and then there was a huge commercial licensing deal that they did with us. Got it. Yep. There's a big gap between making a drug and making a service that complements the compliance, the other data, the behavioral data around it. Ha- have any of the drug companies started building apps and stuff like that to manage what the drug, what happens after you take the drug, does that even exist, or is it just up to doctors and nurses and healthcare providers to like give you a sheet of paper and say, "Hey, follow this protocol"? Because compliance with an app and compliance with email or SMS, it's it works so well, and, and full service works so well. If you just think about getting an Uber or a Postmates or Amazon delivery, you're getting updated all the time. Mm-hmm. But we update a taxi ride and an Amazon delivery to the point of absurdity. And when you take a drug, a powerful drug to handle an important disease and an important life effort, there's nothing surrounding it. There's nothing. No technology, no compliance, no SMS. But if your package arrived and it's in the depot, yeah. I mean, you know it every step yeah, of the way. You know way. where it is, right? You, actually, you know exactly where your driver is with that Chinese food, right? Exactly. Yeah. But and, you you get to ra- and you get to rate... Right. The wonton quali- exactly. versus the, the right. Moogle guy pen. That's right. They want to know. And Egg the pharmaceutical Fuyang companies, not that you take a pharmaceutical and you're like, they don't want any feedback. They get no, no feedback. So, you know, that's in a way what we did, you know, sort of realized was so fucked up about healthcare yeah. was you've got a system that um, is extracting an enormous amount of rent from society. Right. Right. But it's only accountable for delivering the service, not for what the not the outcome of the individual that's receiving the service. Right. right? There's no happiness. So there's no there's no satisfaction associated with um, or, or or care about satisfaction as long Customer as they get paid. Even. Right. No, nothing. Right. There's nothing. So that's where kind of a company like OneDrop and mm. and many others. There's a lot of other great companies out there that are that are 
really making some headway in the digital space for in for healthcare but but this healthcare system and then doctors prescribing and reimbursement and insurance and that's you know we're here at JP Morgan health tech event here in San know, Francisco in San going on this right week. now yeah. massive event everybody's here for for this thing and all they really are worried about is is extracting rent from this system huh. right what we're about at one drop is so rooted in a level of sort of humility and respect and gratitude for the people that we're touching, the, the users. Yeah. Yeah, I have diabetes, right? right? And so I know what that person's feeling. You know, some of our staff has heart disease or hypertension or hyperlipidemia or dealing with a whole suite of other health issues. And so we're coming at this from such a, a profound, you know, level of um, empathy and yeah. humility and we bake that into every touch point that we have for that individual. And in the end, when we help that individual, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find out how to get paid for that. Right. If we focus on that user, if we focus on making that user healthy, giving that user data and insights to make better choices, giving that user the opportunity to live their life, to dance at their granddaughter's wedding, to yeah. to engage in all the, the blessings that we're offered in, in, yeah. in, in life today, when you give somebody that. You know, there's a business. That's the business. The business will be there. And here we're just uh, for those people watching. You can see the stunningly gorgeous kit, beautiful leather case, amazing industrial design. Looks as if a Apple built it themselves. And I guess the business model today is is simply a subscription. You buy the hardware, you get a subscription to the strips and the software. Uh, is that the business today? The business today is twofold. Um, direct to consumer via retail stores. So you mm -hmm. just buy the hardware in the store. And mm -hmm. then if you want the supplies, you can either buy the supplies from us, subscribe, buy them one-offs. Sometimes you can buy them in specific stores. Yeah. Um, that's hardware and physical retail. You can also subscribe to OneDrop either via our app or on our website. What is that? Ten bucks a month, twenty bucks a month. It depends on the subscription, but yeah. twenty-five bucks a month at the at the low end, you know, uh, fifty and change on the high end, um, and that that gives you a variety of different sort of service sets. You get the strips, you get the meter, and you get coaching. Ah, um, yep. explain the coaching because that's something that when we talk about full service yep. and the three hundred sixty degree customer experience, something that you started to pioneer at Razorfish, in fact, is thinking about that whole life of the customer doesn't exist, or if it does exist, it's just some receptionist calling you reading a script. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about compliance and the uh, just the efficacy, actually, even about compliance, the efficacy of a chat coach, because this is occurring in chat. It's a chat coach, yep. The uh, efficacy of chat versus the phone call versus the doctor visit. So there's a couple different reasons why we went with chat versus in-person video conference versus phone call versus yeah. a variety of things. Um, one, uh, we can deploy coaches in a scalable way mm. if the communication is <clears throat> asynchronous. Right. So if it's synchronous, if you have to make, an, uh, make a phone call, then I need a time slot. Right. Then the number of time slots are limited in the day. And right. so then you're limited to basically a coaching utilization problem, right? Yeah. How and they're sequential. That's right. There's no... Concurrency. There, exactly. In an asynchronous communication environment, and especially in an environment where we can send, let's say, group messages, and I and I use that term loosely because I'm not I'm not I'm not thinking group chat. I'm saying uh, let's say somebody has um, a high blood sugar reading of over 300, and I can search my entire patient base. I'm let's say managing 2,000, 4,000, you know, uh, users as a coach. I can search all of them for for users that have had blood sugars over 300 in the last 24 hours, right? Wow. And then I can send a message to them saying, hey, it seems like you've had a high blood sugar in the last 24 hours. Do you want to talk about wow. what went into that? But so there, it's a one-to-one it's a one -to -one message, but sent to uh, a, a sort of that data set. Triaging the data set right. for problems, right? Got it. And I can reach a lot of people in a, in a very efficient way utilizing the coach's time and yeah. asynchronous with the sort of software that we built to, to support that. And right. so then I get a lot of mileage out of coaching utilization. Right. Whereas a doctor phone call, a doctor video conference, any type of direct coach experience is just a, a, a sequential time uh, utilization problem. And, that people and, and you can't scale. It can't just, scale. And people give up. because they, they wake up in the, imagine you woke up in the morning and you got handed a piece of paper that said, here's 13 people 
right. who had over 300, you'd be like, okay, well, there's my day. Done. Yeah. 13. Two. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm done. That's it. Whereas the same person could say, okay, send this message to all 13. Right. We want to know if there's anything that occurred, if they're aware of the fact that that's they're right. at 300. Yep. And here are five things to do. To do. And those five things are obviously going to be standard. Or right. somewhat standardized. Or someone said they or, could edit them right, right down to three. Or text me back and let me know if you want to if you want to engage a little further, right? right? So then some of my day can be spent in that kind of one-on-one, you know, re- real-time chat. But a lot of the day can be spent triaging problems in an asynchronous way, mm-hmm. and it's really scalable. Two, the other thing about coaching is it's super effective. So when you have somebody that you're accountable to, so accountability is yeah. an issue, whether it's a social accountability to a group or accountability to an individual, you end up driving behavior change, which mm. is crucial in all of this. Our coaching services as part of the one drop service um, in over 20 clinical studies now have proven to drive outstanding uh, reductions in A1C, which is the, the 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 value that a person with diabetes is thinking about, at least. Um, outstanding results in terms of health efficacy. Just not wanting to disappoint another That's human right. is a critical part. Totally. And this has come, I, I see this now with young uh, millennials, they have accountability groups. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this trend before. Yep, we, keep, didn't, we didn't keep, have it in the Gen X generation no. or boomers. The snowflakes uh, have it. The snowflakes have it, and they, they're they also unique uh, in each and every Each and every one. Each and every one is unique. They're, as I tell them, <laughs> they're, they're all unique snowflakes, and there's no one like them. That's right. None of the other billion snowflakes that fall every hour are like them. <laughs> no. They're unique. Um, but they all melt when they hit the ground. Uh, so they'll melt eventually. Uh, sorry, snowflakes. We all melt eventually. We all melt eventually. Yeah, that's yeah. the big realization. Yeah. Uh, but they, you know... It seems really wise because if you're going to be meeting with your group on Friday nights to talk about what happened in your startup this week, hey, you may want to put the gas on the pedal on Wednesday and Thursday and cram a little bit and and get that last dev push yep. or get that last yep. sale and be able to to not disappoint your your friends. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know about the trend of glucose obsession continuous glucose meters that my friends who don't have diabetes but are obsessed with quantified self are getting their doctors to prescribe to them and is that a good idea and what is the future of continuous glucose monitoring when we get back on this week's startups the new year is about growth and change you might have made some resolutions you might be off to a great start and if you're a business owner looking to grow your business linkedin can help you find the right hires that set you up for a strong year. You've got plans. You've got a bunch of projections. You've got a bunch of tactics and strategies. And what you need is the people to execute that plan. LinkedIn job screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you need to execute on your plan to dominate and take over the world or whatever your corner of the world happens to be. And with over 600 million members, LinkedIn is there for you to connect and discover new talent, and they get to discover new opportunities for their career, for jobs, for freelancing, whatever it is. In fact, they have a new hire on LinkedIn every eight seconds. It's crazy. They're the number one rated platform for delivery of quality hires. And at launch, we've made two great hires uh, off of LinkedIn in the past year or so. Our uh, studio director, Sir Charles, and our uh, marketing manager, Maureen. Uh, And we're at it again. We're hiring more people. And Associate Press is here posting a job, uh, as you can see, for a client success position in our Toronto office. Podcast is growing. We need to find somebody to help uh, the advertisers and the partners get value and make sure they know when their ads are running, running traffic, sort of like an ad traffic controller. And here, my associate Presh selects the skills needed. He writes a description. He adds additional screening questions. You know what to do. And then he sets a daily budget. Uh, And then he's off to the races and he's going to find a great candidate all within minutes. So here is your call to action. You're not going to believe this, but the fitty is still in play. 5-0 is on the way. LinkedIn Jobs will pay you $50 towards your first job posting. They're going to give you that 50 for free. Go to linkedin.com slash twist. LinkedIn.com. You know it because you've got it up in your browser. It's in one of the tabs. Terms and conditions do apply because they're giving you 50 bucks. So linkedin.com slash twist. 50 bucks. Terms and conditions apply. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back. Jeff Dachis is with us. You can follow him on the Twitter. Jeff Dachis, D-A-C-H-I-S. He's the CEO and founder of OneDrop. You can visit them at OneDrop.today. If you have diabetes or a loved one who has diabetes, go ahead and buy it for them. 
It's the perfect gift. If you miss them at Christmas or they deserve another gift or you just want to be a mensch, go buy a one drop and send it to them. Uh, you can see Jeff's first appearance on the pod from back in June 2015 and compare it to today's episode at episode 547. Uh, thanks to our sponsors for supporting the pod. Uh, when we left our hero, that's you, Jeff. We were talking about continuous glucose monitors. Um, Kevin Rose, Tim Ferriss, all these cats have been talking about. I'm not sure who has them. I, I know Kevin had one at one point, I believe. I was watching his podcast or listening to it. What is the future of those devices? Why do you have to get a prescription to get one? And are they painful to wear? Because you, it's a needle that's permanently in your belly. Mm -hmm. Have you do you wear one mm -hmm. and and what's it like? Well, so let's talk about continuous glucose monitors. I want to just circle back right just to a question that you asked me before yeah. really quick. Yeah. You, you know, we talked about, you know, what's the business model or what what yeah. you know, and we're in retail, we're we're selling subscriptions, you know, to the consumer. We have a B2B business, a huge ah. B2B business where we're selling to self-insured employers too. And we self-insured employers self means what for people who don't know that term. So most employers today of any scale um basically are are, are self-insured. They pay for all the medical claims for all their employees. So instead of getting an insurance company, Correct. they put a billion dollars on the side or a hundred million. And they just pay out all the hospital claims and everything. And they just like pay them all out. Yep. They pay everything. So they have no insurance company. They have an insurance company to administrate that, but they, but not ah. to provide insurance. Correct. Wow. Yep. So they just become the admins. Correct. How come, since we're going to go down on this tangent here. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. No, it's good. How come, this is where we're going down this path, how come- uh, they don't just hire a bunch of general practitioners and start their own hospital and have it on their campus. Like I know that some, some people of them have do, to, right? They do. Well, like I'm not not a hospital, but like Apple has health services on campus, right? Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, so uh, if you need to see a general practitioner because you have a cold and you want to get right. a Z pack or something, that's right, it's right on campus. Really? A lot of companies have that. Yeah, yeah. in house clinics. Yep. And, and so those doctors work for some third party who placed them there, or they actually work for Apple? Um, depends. Ah. So most of the time, there is a third party contracted service to provide that sort of in house mm. medical care. Um, and you got to break this down. You know, all healthcare is not the same. You've got acute care, right? Where I need a brain surgery. Right. Right. Or a broken limb. It's yep. like that shit's uh, like emergency room. I got to, it's, that's, that's right. Yeah, I'm now. not waiting till Monday morning. That's right. It's not something I can think yeah. about. You've got um, primary care, which is your, you know, throat and your nose and throat, my regular checkups, all the normal stuff, right? right. You've got um, your uh, chronic care, which is these chronic conditions that we, um, uh, uh, you know, have to deal with regardless of what kind of insurance have, regardless of the doctor. Asthma, diabetes, all, all heart these, disease. Exactly. Yeah. And then you've got urgent care, which is that sort of like right now, um, I, I, I need to go to the emergency room or I'm going to go to the minute clinic at, at, at Walgreens or whatever, right? And so of those kinds of care, primary care and urgent care, a, a lot of times is on campus, um, you know, yeah. in some of these companies. But most big companies are self-insuring. They're, yeah. they're just paying out the claim. So, so they have a vested interest in keeping people healthy. So now you actually have a customer. Yes. Who's paying the bill. That's right. Who cares about lowering the bills. Lows, cares and, about lowering the cost because no one else does. No, I mean, this is the craziness about America's horrific healthcare. It's an embarrassment because they don't publish their prices. You don't know yeah. what you're paying. Nope. They've obscurified the payment process from the individuals. The individual has no idea what the company's paying to the insurance company, who's getting billed. And then the insurance company then becomes the customer. It, it, it doesn't right. make any sense it, to me. And they don't even have on their website the price. And from what I understand, they've, they're they starting to do legislation around publishing prices. Publishing pricing. And they're afraid. And they are scared to death because it turns out knee surgery uh, has a range of That's like right. 15000 to $300,000. Yep. A 20X range yep. to just get your knee scoped yep. for your meniscus being torn. That's bonkers. Crazy, right? It's bonkers. Yep. And, you know, just to add fuel to the fire, you know, insurance companies are obligated to spend 80% of the premiums they collect on services. And they're only allowed to keep 20% for admin and profit, right? So that's been capped. The 80-20 the rule, right? Right. So then how does an insurer increase their profits? 
Yeah. You increase the cost of care. Just think about you the alignment. You just let the cost of care increase, right? The alignment is crazy. Why don't they make it based upon how happy the customer is and no. the NPS score? No. Or wait times? Nope. Or how long people live or their BMI or something? Yep. It's bonkers. So insurers then buy providers, right? So United Healthcare, as an example, as an insurer, has the a whole set, set of providers, right? So it- United so they're making the money pro- on that. They're making money on the provider side, and then they're making money on the insurance premium side. Oh, my Lord. And then Lord. they allow for the cost of care to increase because then their 20% that's left yeah, over of a bigger dipping. pie. It's oh. a bigger pie. Oh. Yeah. And Talk so about it. It's a crazy a, space. A, a perverse incentive system. That's right. So some employers have taken that into them, their own their own hands and said, we're going to own the cost of care, and but we're going to then work like dogs to keep our people healthy. And so we're selling our services now in diabetes, pre-diabetes, weight loss, hypertension, and high cholesterol ah. programs with coaches, with measuring of a scale or a blood pressure cuff or a glucose meter. Um, we're selling all of that into an employer wow. who wants to keep those people healthy for so those chronic conditions. if they pay you $500 a year, $1,000 a year, and that person's BMI goes from the 30s down into the 20s where it belongs, right. that could save them what? Tens of thousands. Per year. Yep. Think about that. Yep. And they should be passing along some incentive through their employees. Like imagine if, it, and I know this is super controversial, yeah. but in my world, if you know employees at a 35 BMI and they're you know seriously obese and they, for every BMI they lose, you know, point of BMI, mm-hmm. they should get some reward, you know, like a day off or- a thousand dollars or something. Yep. I mean, or if you're if you maintain a BMI under twenty six or something, plus other stuff, whatever, you know, because I know it's not in, a, in isolation. It's not the only thing that matters, but it's super important. Whether it's BMI or whether it's A one C for diabetes yeah. or whether it's lowering your blood pressure or what that translates into productivity gains for the for the. Oh right, you're a better worker. Yeah, you're just a better worker. You know, I and keep you're you out on less. the job, right? I'm you're out less. I don't have to retrain somebody. I don't have to bring in a new employee. And you don't have ten thousand dollars in in medical expenses in medical that I'm expenses. picking up the cost of. Correct. Yep. Should this all be connected to employers? Should employers have to be involved in your health care? This seems to me to be like one of the big, I don't know, flaws in our system. So it's a weird thing, right? So it started off a long time ago where um, you know, the the employer um, decided to provide, in essence, a tax-free be- tax-free benefit to lure workers. Right. Right. I want to. I have. I'm running all these factories, and the one way that I can like keep people at my factory working yeah. is to provide them with this be- this this extra benefit that they were having to come out of pocket for before because there wasn't in really yeah. insurance. Yeah. And then it became before. a standard. And but it, and it was tax-free. Ah. Uh. Right. So because you know the the employer's picking up this in essence cash incentive to you um, pre-tax. Right, and so this this sort of pre tax uh, uh, employee benefit grew, you know, out of a desire to retain employees. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in, I, I want to say in, in in the in the teens or twenties yeah. in the last century. Yeah, it's crazy because now <laughs> it's created so many perverse. You talk about incentives. Totally. I can't tell you how many people I've seen at startups, my own and ones that I've invested in, where they have some amazing employee who can come work there because there's some crazy insurance True. issue, or they have some employee who they have to get rid of, and the CEO is devastated because they know the impact that- uh, They have a family insurance. They have a family, yeah, yeah, or they have some yeah. chronic disease yeah. or something acute, and they're just like, oh my God, I, I, I can't let this person go because of their insurance. I feel terrible. What do we do? And then you're in a board meeting talking about you know, COBRA or how long can That's we extend right. this? <laughs> And it just seems to me, and you know, listen, I'm as capitalist as they come, that this is some sort of a a basic human right. It would be an incredible unlock if companies didn't have to deal with this and people could freely move between companies without this fear. Of losing insurance. I agree. Of losing insurance. Agreed. Or- And what, you're a capitalist too. You're not a socialist. No. But what I do believe is that consumerized, you know, accessible, affordable care is coming you know, via the technology you and I all believe in. And when that all comes, then we'll be able to pay a much lower fee. It's going to take out some of this margin and perverse incentives. And so the costs are just naturally come down because of the competition of the private markets and people like you creating and solving very acute problems like this or being really focused on it. 
Yeah, I think you're going to see consumerized healthcare become yeah. a, a much bigger part of reality. You, you're in calm, right? Yeah. Right? It and it's helping a lot of people, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, if you just think about mental health, I mean, I hate to be like supporting Tom Cruise's insane rant, yeah. but he's not wrong that talking to people and working out and eating well directly correlates with a reduction totally. in anxiety and depression. Like, this is known. 100%. I mean, they, the first thing a doctor will tell you is like, if you're depressed, is like, go for a hike with your friends and talk to them and have a healthy meal and tell me how you feel after those three yeah. hours. And, you know, you don't have to jump up and down on a couch to, to know that's right. true. Like, and, you know, calm has just been amazing for people. They can't sleep. I mean, and, and how much of all of these diseases are just based upon, you know, the amount of bounty we have in the world right now. You, you mm -hmm. think about most people with diabetes, it's because they're eating too much, correct? Uh, it's genetic, uh, just to say like 100% genetic for every single person. And then what triggers it can be, you know, an excess, you know, gaining weight. Or the epidemic yes. is in some way correlated with this modern diet of... I think we're all consuming like way too many carbs. So way too many. say like there's, we're, we're inundated with carbs, right? Yeah. So then, and this is going to touch on your question earlier about Kevin Rose, et cetera. Yeah. But we're eating all these carbs and they're in every single thing we have. They're in our bread. They're in our ketchup. They're in our... Every single thing that we have in society today and processed food, any kind of processed or, or modern commercial food has excess carbs in it, right? So now your body's consuming all these carbs. Guess what happens? Your, your pancreas produces insulin to allow for your body to either absorb those carbs or, you know, those carbs turn into fat. And what happens is with too much excess carbs and an overtaxing of your pancreas and, and insulin production, um, you end up building up this resistance, you know, yeah. and insulin resistance is type two diabetes. It's amazing. Like, you and just think about what we've done to ourselves. We wrapped every protein and vegetable in flour and sugar. Yeah. And sugar. Yep. It's just like, wow, these things are perfect. How can we make them to go? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And this book, Wheat Belly, yes, and Why We're Fat. I read those that's two right. books, and it really I dramatically reduced my carbs. Yep. And it's just like if you if you think about the modern American diet. We wanted to take stuff on the go. So they're just like, yeah, here's a hot dog in that's a bun. Right. Here's a hamburger in a bun. And that's progress. And that was progress at that's the time. Right. It was like, yeah, listen, you can get to work. I got to go to work. Here's an egg sandwich, right? And here's pizza. And they just right. wrap everything. And then that corn syrup, adding the sugar right. to it and adding sugar to things that are unnecessary. It's killing us. It's it's literally killing us. That's okay, right. When we get back from this quick break, we're going to get back to that question, the cliffhanger about um, the continuous glucose monitors. Yep. And then I want to know... If there is a chance in the next 10, 20, or 30 years that we will be able to cure diabetes when we get back on This Week in Startups. It is 2020, and you need to start fresh and start thinking about all of those challenges you have in your business, inside of your startup, inside of your venture firm, or maybe you're an angel investor. And the way to solve your problems is to have the right software. And there is so much amazing software coming out. How can you? you quickly find the best one and not make a costly mistake or overpay, which is another mistake. Well, there is a way to do that, and it's Capterra. You know Capterra. You've used it. You've heard me talk about it before. They have over 1 million reviews in 700 specific software categories. And when we need a new piece of software, Capterra is that source for us to make better decisions. And here is Presh. Presh is our associate, and we were looking for sales automation tools because we wanted to save some money, and we wanted the right size tool for our size team. There's so many different products out there. Some of them are too complex for a 15-person company. They're meant for a 1,500-person company. We go through the reviews. We set some filters, like the number of employees that the software is optimized for, and we create a side-by-side -side comparison. And... We look at things like ease of use and customer support, features, functionality, and of course, value for money, which I always talk about. Uh, and we picked the one that we were able to select, a free trial option for it to test out, and we fell in love with PipeDrive, uh, and it's worked great. Visit Capterra, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot -E com slash twist for free today to find the tools you need to make informed software decisions for your business. Join the millions, and I mean millions, of people who use Capterra every month. Capterra dot com slash twist. When you think about your business, think about software that'll make you bionic, keep you from having to just hire a bunch of people to build custom software. No, don't do it that way. The software is out there. You just need a guide and the gr the best guide in the business is capterra.com slash twist, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash twist. 
Thank you for supporting this episode of This Week in Startups. Let's get back to this episode. All right, we're talking about diabetes, one drop, as well as just the overall healthcare picture, how hard it is to do startups in here. You're in year six. You got, what, $60 million into this company raised so far total? 58.8, yeah. Yeah, and it's been hard. It's been hard. But boy, is it rewarding. It's immensely rewarding. I wake yeah. up every day leaping out of bed, excited to help all the people that we get to help. Amazing. We talked about those glucose monitors, those continuous ones. Have you worn one before? I have, yeah. What's it like to have a needle stuck in you all day long, and how long can you keep those in? Does it get infected? And is there going to be a better solution to knowing our glucose and insulin? Is it knowing your insulin level or your glucose level? Glucose level. What is the impact of knowing your glucose level on behavior? So a whole bunch of different things. You know, one, you know, when we eat carbohydrates, our pancreas produces insulin to allow us to absorb those carbohydrates into our body. Yep. If we don't produce insulin, like me, I don't produce insulin, the carbohydrates, the sugar will just stay in my blood, uh. inside my blood, right? And it'll be circulating. And that, and it acts like sort of like glass shards. Think about Ugh. really high, and, and those glass shards circulating through my whole body start to eat away my capillaries in my eyes and my heart valves and my fingers. And wow. over years, you imagine this that, sort of like yeah. glass circulating in your body, shredding the insides of your body, right? That's wow. kind of what it does, right? I never understood so, that. If your body either is resistant to the insulin you're producing or um, doesn't produce it like mine, um, you either need to take insulin, right? Mm -hmm. Or take more insulin because the body, because uh, your body's resistant to the insulin you're, you, you know, it's already producing. So type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. Type 1 diabetes is I don't produce any insulin. And so we got to get that sugar out of our bodies, right? Or turned into energy or something, right? Right. So that's you can what either does. start walking up step flights of stairs. Fl that burns the sugar. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, which is difficult if you eat a Cinnabon <laughs> when you have two slices of pizza. I mean, what that's does right. it go up to? What is the, what do you call the number? Is it the... Uh, no, that's just blood sugar level. Your yeah, B, so your what BG is levels. The, when you say 300, is that the equivalent of eating a, a Cinnabon or something insane? For me, like a Cinnabon would take me up to like 500. Really? Like a th one of those big Cinnabons with the sh with the frosting on it or whatever. I mean, I would, you I, can I, smell I, those four gates yeah, away. so good. What are they doing? They're like, so good. I who, know, what, who in their right mind <laughs> decides that a cinnamon bun which was a delicate little three-byte experience, yes. needs to be the size of a goddamn 45 record. That's right. It, for kids, that would be like a small Frisbee or a small <laughs> like um, appetizer plate. But literally, they made one that's, those things are 1,500 calories or something insane. Oh, it's way more. It's got to be like 3,000 calories. Okay. Or whatever, for the big one. Or whatever. For the big I, one. I, I, and I, it's I, bonkers. Yes. And I see people eating these, and I'm just thinking, what are you doing to your body? Like <laughs> They're so the good, though. They're they incredible. They smell so but, good. It's like, oh, it's calling me. Like, it's like a zombie apocalypse. So you like, can't calling. possibly burn <laughs> that off. I mean, it it'll take you like hours. all day. Right? Take all day. It's yeah. Like hours. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to take a shot of insulin. So then I just take insulin. Exactly. And I have to get take a big dose. Now, insulin is like a really blunt instrument. So then you take this big dose of insulin and like, you might get it right. You might not get it right. Uh, um, and most people don't get it right. You know, and then so Does, then is there a certain feeling that comes when you shoot the insulin? Does it feel good to get the sugar out of the system, or you don't feel it, or um, do you feel if, tired? If, if you're high with blood, if you have high, super high blood sugars, um, different people react in different ways. So I, you know, I'll yeah. speak for myself only. Yeah, but um, I get really sluggish. Uh, I get really tired. Mm. Um, I get cranky and irritable. Uh, um, yeah, so it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. The, and shooting I, yourself with a needle is not pleasant by default. You know, I don't mind that. The, some people do. Some people are afraid of the needles. Yeah. I don't. I, None of that. None of the needles really bother me. Um, but if you overdose on insulin, which most people who take insulin do, most people who take insulin are overdosing on insulin frequently, uh. then you have low blood sugar. And that is a scary thing because you can go into a coma and die with low blood sugar. Oh, my right? Lord. Yeah. And so you get diabetic ketoacidosis on the high side if you go too high for too long, and you have death and coma on the low side if you, if you overdose on insulin. And most wow. people don't ever get it right. And the insulin you take in America is absurdly expensive. Oh my God. I, I, don't get me started on insulin pricing. It's a whole like ridiculous thing. But in thing. Canada, it's essentially like almost free, right? It's like super cheap compared to here. Most other countries have um, a, a, a cap on insulin pricing. Right. But yep. here in America, they no. just price gouge you like crazy. Yeah. I mean, yes. Can you um, have diabetes <laughs> and never have to take insulin because you manage it so well? Like if you just ate vegetables and proteins? So a type two, a person with type two diabetes can in effect um, manage and potentially even reverse wow. their diabetes um, through diet and exercise. But they never Some. do. 
M- most don't, but it's yeah. possible. Um, a guy, there's a guy here who, who in in a valley here, uh, Sammy, who started a company called Verta Health, and Verta, um, you know, they 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 have a clinic, a virtual clinic that they they deliver in 50 states that um, prescribes a low carb, no carb diet, a keto ketogenic diet. Right. Um, and uh, they try to keep people on ketogenic, and they try to reverse people's diabetes. And wow. And and uh, good for them. I, I can't see a trucking company have right. all of its truckers go keto and yeah. reverse all their diabetes. Like that's yeah, not hard. a solution that I think do is Do the scalable. fake sugars trigger it? Do like the, if you- um, if so Somewhat, yes and no, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there not, it doesn't trigger it the way sugar triggers it mm. or or carbs trigger it. Right. But there's uh, there are some studies that link to diet soda and link to some of these yeah. artificial sweeteners that, that do some weird stuff. Uh, so these continuous glucose yeah. monitors, are they going to go mainstream? Do you see a time when- they become over the counter and people are just, you know, who are obese or who are optimizing their health, just start to know their sugar levels in order to be fit, in order to have better focus. Yep. Because it's going like crazy here. I mean, a lot of people mm-hmm. have them here and a lot, not a lot, but a, a number There's of a people lot. have, it's a lot, yeah. Um, so, well, let me, let me, let me put it in perspective for you. Uh, 500 million people worldwide with diabetes. Yeah. Okay. 30 million Americans with diabetes. Okay. Okay. The total market worldwide for continuous glucose monitors, yeah. all in the number of people that are on that product right now, right. worldwide is about 2 million. Oh, wow. So it's expensive and painful. Super and annoying. expensive. The needle's about a half inch long. Um, it's like a harpoon that goes into you. And then the wound that, um, that it makes uh, starts to fill with um, interstitial fluid and fluids. Uh, and, yeah. and then the sensor that's on that harpoon, in essence, yeah. um, starts to uh, interact yeah. with the interstitial fluid as the wound heals around it, um, and that's what's what, what you're measuring the blood in, you know, the blood glucose in, in that yeah. fluid. Yeah. So it's gruesome and it's not. Pain. It's it's not that gruesome. If it's you a, move around, do you feel it? No, Does it hurt? No, no, no. no. I mean, no, I have to say they do a good job. The two major players are, yeah. are Dexcom and Abbott. Yeah. Um, Abbott has a product called Freestyle Libre. Dexcom has the G6 right now, and then um, Medtronic has a product, but it's it's uh, not not really in the mix. Will and will that ever become? Will it ever become possible to know this sugar level in your blood without something so intrusive? Yes. And when do we think people will start to be able to do that? Will you ever be able to look at your Apple Watch and know? Or? So I don't know if it's going to come right from the Apple Watch yeah. um, per se, but I do think that sort of biometric sensing, mm. multi-sensorial products, multi-analytes that can measure multiple things, I definitely think that's on the horizon. Mm. And I do think that there's a painless, um, uh, minimally invasive products that are that are going to be on, on the horizon. And I think you're going to start to see Five people- years, 10 years? Within that time frame, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. When we left, I was curious, you know, the people who I knew 10 years ago, you know, just studying the genome and, um, you know, who were in the CRISPR space, et cetera, mm-hmm. they said they couldn't ever have guessed we would have been where we are now 10 years ago. But these are people in that industry. They just right. can't believe how far things have gotten. And fast. And, and how fast this is all moving yeah. and how cheap it is to sequence a genome and, and to do custom medicine. Is there a possibility in 20, 30, 40 years that something like diabetes could be eradicated somehow? And is that a conversation? Is there research going on about that? Or do, you know, like Alzheimer's and some other things, do people think that's just like one of the last things that'll fall? One of the last things we'll be able to reverse and or let's say cure. So, you know, this is just me. Like, yeah, on the your edge, personal whatever, opinion. Whatever, my yeah. personal opinion. Um, on the one end of the spectrum, you've got the, the genome, right? And so since diabetes is inherently genetic, mm. um, I have hope that there will be the possibility that we can do something genetically to, um, to keep people from getting insulin resistance or from uh, you know, having type one diabetes where their pancreas is attacked by their immune system. Um, those two, two things, you know, potentially could, uh, be, 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 be eradicated, um, managed, managed, well, cured. Yeah. yeah, Cured that way. Now on the flip side of it, you've got a diabetes industry that, um, generates, uh, you know, on the order of, it costs, you know, in the U S about 200, $312 billion annually. For those 30, 30 million people. 30 million people. Yeah. $312 billion annually is the cost of diabetes in America today. 
So yes. about ten thousand a person, a thousand a month per person, right. something in that range. Yeah. yeah. So wow. when you add up all the money that's getting extracted from the system, right, right, those interests, the people that have interest in that money, right, um, are going to fight like hell to maintain it. Maintain. Right. The solution's not coming from <laughs> them. Right. And that's. I don't think the solution's going to come from them. Yeah. No. They would. Yeah. It's, they're not going to. You're not going to find the cure for. Getting off of nicotine and tobacco from a tobacco company, a tobacco company, <laughs> anytime. But let me say, like, one, I have an immense amount of respect for um, the drug companies and the people in the yeah. pharma and healthcare industries that do their best yeah. to try to help people right. with diabetes and with other chronic conditions. So let me give like all the props and all the respect and all the gratitude for you know everybody who's in this business trying. Yeah. They're trying. They're trying. Yeah. They're trying to make a difference Is, in people's lives. Have they come up with drugs that would increase the insulin in your system orally? Is that possible instead of taking the shot? Is there like a precursor? There because I know there's metformin. Metformin is a precursor. Yep. Right. Because people now, these keto people yep. are taking, taking metformin, metformin yeah. to well, I guess lower their glucose level. Yep. And um, then keep have a lower reading and therefore stay in ketosis. So they take metformin. Which is a, which is an interesting um, twist on the on 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 that drug. That's that class of drugs is an SGLT two, and it's a it's it's really the first line of defense for people with diabetes. That uh, that's the first drug you get put on is metformin yeah. or some some form of that. Um, there's another class of drugs which is really interesting called the GLP one class, uh, and GLP ones you might you might know the the some people know the names of Saxenda or Victoza. Saxenda is like a double dose. Victoza is a single dose. Um, Usually used to treat tight, uh, 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 obesity, mm. um, which is sort of pre, you know, pre yeah. precursor to diabetes in some ways, right? Um, because it it acts in a bunch of different ways, but one of them is rest uh, constricting the the digestive process so that you feel full most mm. of the time. Two, um, it it does some other it does some other cool things, but yeah. Um, the GLP ones and the SGLT twos, I think, are really interesting classes and revolutionary drugs. Um, that, that may in effect, um, you know, be a, a, uh, a huge driver in helping people not, not advance as fast into diabetes. I was, I was listening either to Tim Ferriss or Kevin Rose's podcast, or it might've been another one, but I think it was one of their two. And they were talking to somebody who's a life extension guy and he takes metformin. Yes. And he says That's he right. thinks that yep. every Everybody. human being is going to be on metformin yes. because of the fact that it's going to let your body rest more and you're going to have less degeneration of cells, yep. I guess. It does some cool stuff. It has yeah. cardiovascular benefit. Um, people on, in the anti-aging crew um, absolutely believe in metformin. And then I think, again, this other class of drugs, that's uh, the GLP-1s. There's now, just recently, in the last call it six, less than six months, uh, a rebelsis is um, an oral version of what had been an injectable wow. GLP-1. And Rebelsis, I think, is going to be a revolutionary product. So whether you the way you feel about metformin, you know, Rebelsis, I think it's going to be a blockbuster. Yep. It's made by a company called Nova Nordisk. And, and you think we're going to extend lifespan significantly, like beyond the one or two years we do every 10 years, but like, do you think there's going to be a step function where we get to 120, 130 years old, like where averages go up and is that going to be our generation or our know, kids? Man. I keep talking to my son. I'm like, hey man, you better figure out this this aging thing because like I plan to stick around for a while. Yeah. Um, I think we might get the tail end of yeah, it. The very tail end, exactly. That would be so yeah, cool if like cool. we were like 80 and skiing, you know, or 90 <laughs> I plan to be skiing. 80 and skiing. Well, I mean, if I'm you going to skiing with you when we're I 80. Know. I, that would be amazing. <laughs> like, just think about this. There were people who, you know, like our parents and, you know, they buried their parents, what, 50, 55, yeah. 60, which is the age you and I are coming up on now. You know, I'm 49 now. Did you hit 50 53. yet? You're 53. Yeah. Like, we're at the, feels like, peak age of our life. And yeah. everybody else is winding down and dying of yeah. breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. And now that got pushed out, pushed us out to the seventies. Exactly. Yeah. Now we're getting out to our seventies, eighties. But for some reason, people are just li healthier too. Their bodies are not breaking down, and people are skiing in their seventies. Yeah. Can you imagine a bunch of people skiing in their eighties and nineties? Like this would be a magical thing. I mean, I wanted to say, like, I, I, I just spent you know part of the, the Christmas holiday with my mom, who's ninety five. 
Wow. You know, and she was so in Mexico and um, she was amazing, you know, and going in the ocean and like, like if I, if I can only be as lucky as, 95. as she is. And I hopefully got a bunch more years on her too, you know, so. That's amazing just, when you think about it. My, my Irish grandparents lived, uh, I think, 96 and 91. That's amazing. And that right. is that extraordinary. Like, yeah. So it seems like you got a bunch of miles I have left some, in the tank. I got some good genes in there. Mm-hmm. I think this calorie restricting thing, which I've been, I did a 86 days in a row of 13 hours or more of fasting. I averaged, you did? I averaged 16 and a half hours over the first 86 days. I did fasting this past 86 days. I lost like, you know, whatever, eight, nine pounds. But I wasn't doing it really to lose weight. I was trying to see if this fasting thing and resting your body, the impact it would have on me. And it had a profound impact, I think, on my focus level. My energy level during the day, a lot more focused. My sleep got better. Mm -hmm. I felt I was sleeping better. And I didn't feel... Also, you recapture a lot of time. You take out a meal. like All of a sudden, you recapture an hour and a half. Yeah. And so you're spending four or five hours a day. You you capture an hour and a half a day. If you're working for 10 hours a day, you're you're getting 15% more work done. Mm -hmm. It's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I recaptured that time, was able to redeploy it and other things. Um, but I also felt like for the first time in my life, I was in control of my consumption of food. I could never control what I eat in the moment, like when there's a plate of food in front of me. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, skipping a meal seems super easy. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I just yeah, get a meal and I'll go work and or go hang out with my kids and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I just think that's... Do, do people with diabetes fast? Is that part of the protocol? So the same stuff that you're seeing from these quantified selfers, right? Whether it's CGM or whether it's metformin or whether it's um, you know intermittent fasting... Um, all this kind of biohacking is happening right now, yeah. right? And I think, you know, not everything is going to deliver the results, whether if I put butter in my coffee or whatever, like I'm not certain that that's like- Yeah, that's a weird one. I don't, well, okay, but like, yeah. but so that's one of them that right. might not be a thing, yeah. but it sure does taste good. I have to say, I love the butter coffee. Yeah, you like it? I, 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 do. I did the MCT oil. Yep. And let me just say, MCT oil, if you take too much- it, it, you're not leaving the bathroom. Like, it, <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't want to say it. I, I don't mean to get graphic <laughs> on this podcast, but God damn you, Tim Ferriss, yeah, and that man, MCT that, oil, like because I did that oil. one time, and I did a very small amount, and I couldn't, I mean, it was brutal. <laughs> and I think that that thing is just like, for some people, it just has, for me, it, it, it's like when they- uh, yeah, give you that drug to flush you out, whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, for like, the colonoscopy. For the colonoscopy, yeah, they give yeah, you some yeah. drug that's supposed to be hilarious yeah. because, <laughs> you know, you just basically are See tied ya. to the toilet for 24 hours. <laughs> that's what happened to me on MCT oil. I do not recommend it, it people. <laughs> <laughs> Don't add it to the butter coffee. Uh, but I think all that stuff's like, there's a lot, there's, you know, we're going to, we're going to crack the code on some of this, right? Um, it feels like, yeah, we're getting really close and there's something about the genome, you know, watching this CRISPR stuff and like. I don't know if you saw the twins born, you know, this guy in China. Oh, my God. I, yeah, it was crazy. He should not have done this, obviously. He went against all ethics and morality, but he flipped the, the switch. Genie's out of the this, bottle, man. The genie's out of the bottle. And if there's one guy in China who did it and then published a paper on it, I'm sure there's a hundred yeah, times. It's, it's not the first time they've done it. Yeah. Um, and he tried to flip some genes to make these twins, Lulu and I forgot the other twin's name, um, HIV resistant, mm-hmm. which is really great awesome. idea. Just maybe not on humans yet. Like the yeah. CRISPR people were aghast. Like, do not use it on humans. But, but would you? I mean, so there's like all, all, all cards on the table. If you could, if you had a selection of ten switches that you could switch off or on or whatever, yeah. like that were obvious. Like, oh, right. no, HIV resistant yeah. or you know heart disease resistant or cancer, some form of cancer resistant. Would would you? If you could, if you could, if you, I mean, for myself process, personally, yeah, yeah, if yeah. I could say I was born and I would, and my parents could let me make the decision, I probably would take the risk. Yeah, we'd have to think about the actuary table and what percentage. No, no, you're having kids. You're about to have kids. And, oh yeah, and you get to select, te- you know, six switches you can switch. Oh my god, would you do forget it. it. You yeah, do it, right? Flipping everything, man. Right. I'm like That's a. Right. I'm running the light show, right. like, at it's the, like you're, you're, yeah, right. I'm, put the I'm, mixers up to eleven. Or whatever, yeah, I'm at right? Carnegie yeah. Mount. I'm at like Carnegie Hall, like flipping all the light switches in the yeah. back of the of the soundboard. Yeah, of right. course, like. And then the question becomes, okay, you know, eradicating diseases, preventing diseases, you know, that's all obvious stuff. But how about six inches taller, I call 25% it, right? yeah. more muscle mass, that's right. 10 more IQ points. Yeah, and that's where things get fucked And up. that's where you got to really start to think like, well, I think China's going to do that. Because if you're a country that feels competitive, yep. like, and you're run 
by an authoritarian regime who is looking at America and the free world. Yeah, I could see North Korea saying, you know what? Let's give everybody 20 more IQ points. Let's make everybody six foot five and let's see what happens. We got nothing to lose. Yeah. And that's where it gets really scary. And, and, and you know, that was the Nazis, obviously, were pursuing eugenics yeah. and, and crossbreeding and all this kind of stuff. But the difference between then and now is that that was they science fiction and now it's science fact. Yep. You can actually do it. It's scary. There's some scary stuff coming or brilliant. And it's both. You know, it's both. And when you have countries that do not ascribe to any kind of rule set or common humanity rule set, yeah, I think they're going to get there first. They're going to get there first. Bad, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like, that's actually I think, the existential problem for the free world, for the democracies, America, et cetera, like Europe. We are actually thinking about the moral issues. Um, and they're just like, fuck it. Let's just do it. Yeah, they're just like, fuck it. Yeah. What do we got to lose? Yeah. If we can get an edge, yep. we're getting the edge. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're behind the eight ball here. Let's try to advance. It's like the Russians, like, they're like, we're not going to win the Olympics unless- Right. We start, you know, doing, you know, some serious uh, steroids enhancing. and performance yeah. enhancers. Wow. Brave new world. Listen, Jeff, I, you know, it's really, uh, it's been a great friendship uh, and it's good to know you, Jeff Dantras. And I you really too, appreciate uh, you letting me on the cap table. And I'm just so proud of the work you're doing. It's really great to see you doing your best life's work because I saw the first time yeah. you doing your best life's work. And it's just great to see you doing it again. Yeah. Right. And it, 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 it's so cute. meaningful for you. And it's so meaningful for me to be along for the ride knowing it's meaningful for you. Wow. You know, it's a real mitzvah you did letting me be involved because I get to sit here and watch you do your life's work. And wow. that really is like as an angel investor and you supported me in my early day when mm. I was hustling and it's just great to see. Congratulations mm. on Bear. Congratulations to Bear for doing this. And thank you to uh, Stu at RRE Ventures. <laughs> if you're in New York and you want to meet a great venture capitalist like the one who backed Jeff in one drop, um, you know, Stu Elman. Elman. Yeah, Stuart Elman. Stuart Elman. Just a tremendous human being. Great huh? guy. Yep. Just a great guy. Yeah, totally. And a great firm, RRE Ventures. And uh, let's book him. Hey, Nick, let's book him when I'm in New York, okay? Stuart Allman. Jeff Dosh has continued success. If you're listening to the program right now and you know somebody impacted by uh, diabetes in any way, I want you to go to OneDrop.today, buy them the kit, send them the link, tweet it out, favorite it, share it on Facebook. Let's get the word out about this very important product. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Thanks, Jason.